everyone. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down the other half of Steel Division, Infantry Combat. I've already done a video on Armored Tactics, and I will link that in the description if you haven't seen that and want to. For this video, we will be looking at Unit Strength, which is the number of members it has, Weapons, Usefulness, and some mechanics as to how well they work together. With that in mind, let's get into some general mechanics, and after that we'll hop into the stats. Infantry and Forests take less suppression damage and less damage overall than infantry outside of Forests. On top of this, infantry that are stationary take less damage than infantry on the move. Using the attack move command with infantry will have them take what the game deems as the safest route, not the most efficient route. Try your best to emulate this in your planning by only making infantry walk in forests, through cities, or if you're going to brave the open by using smoke grenades or artillery to cross safely. This is especially true on the allied side, as they have the more limited ranged weapons between the two. Automachiki caught in the open are helpless to return fire due to their short range. Infantry squads can also take cover in buildings, occupying usually one or two of them between the squads. This gives a large defensive buff and limits their sight lines depending on what's around them. There's a feature in the menu that determines what a unit will do while it's idle, and this feature defaults to them taking cover. While I find this annoying, it does mean that your infantry will climb into buildings when nearby or shelter themselves in forests without your say-so. This is not true if they have orders. If you tell your units to attack move, for example, and they stop on a building to fire, they probably won't take cover there. My preference leans towards them doing nothing, as sometimes you will tell a unit to stand in one particular spot and they will decide that nearby there is better cover and move to that, and it can lead to some tactical faux pas, to say the least. Before I jump into stats for either side, I want everyone to bear in mind that return fire and efficient shot are once again your best friends. Without using either of these, your troops are very likely to open up on the first thing they see within the range of their light machine guns, leaving them exposed to not only that squad, but also everything around that squad. Beware to only take engagements like this on your terms. Maybe an excellent idea to harry infantry coming into the city with your long-ranged guns, but usually it just gets your people killed. There are also some general differences between Axis and Allies that I want to go over ahead of time. Axis infantry, on average, tends to be more effective and more expensive. While this isn't always the case, for the most part the Axis infantry is better at a cost. One needs look no further than the Sturmjäger or Sturmschatzen. These are fantastic units, but they clock in at 40 points, more expensive than most any Allied squad. The other huge difference is where either faction draws the line for close quarters. The majority of close range units in the game only have a 100 meter range, while the Axis are typically around 300 meter range with their most dangerous units bringing in MP44s. While the MP40 and some German units using PPSHs only have a 100 meter range, as an allied player I would advise you plan for the worst and force the engagement in city blocks or heavy forests where their advantages of range are nullified. Now let's get down into some units and how they act and whatnot. First for the allies, we have the Guardia and Strelki. While these are in different decks, they are functionally the same unit. They're your standard frontline troops with a decent mid-range engagement option. The Mazen isn't the best weapon, but it's good enough, and the DP is a great option for supporting long-ranged engagements and decimating people in mid-range, all the same. They also have a PPSH, but in my experience, 90% of the time, they're just going to be unfired until they die. With an 11-man squad, they usually outnumber the German Panzergrenadier by one unit, and unlike the base Panzergrens, they come with an AT option at full availability. We will get into what I mean by that more when we get look at the Panzergrin, but bear that in mind for now. These guys are great. You get a ton of them per phase, and at 20 points they're just fantastic units. I would keep them away from closer ranged engagements because they have a tendency to get wrecked up close by German units. It goes without saying as far as I'm concerned, but always keep them commanded if you can. Free accuracy is free. Also, unlike commanding tanks, commanding infantry gives them a massive buff to their survivability. A case could be made because of this to bring them in at one star so that they are, can be buffed up to three stars. That said, I typically only bring them in at no star veterancy, so that's just going to be a personal decision between you and your decks. Next up, we have their better older brothers, the Guardia and Strelki DP. Five points more expensive, but they have a lot of usability to show for it. These guys did the sensible thing and traded one of their PPSHs for the DP-28 and sport a PTRD anti-tank rifle instead of hand grenades. While their AT rifle lacks the lethality of the grenades or even the accuracy, it is much further ranged at 500 meters instead of 100 meters. This gives you a great option to deal with incoming troop transports before they're unloaded or even 
the light half-tracks supporting German troops. The double DP really does a number on infantry at mid to long range, and they support one more person than the other squad, making them a bit more survivable. I tend to bring these guys in in phase A if I only get one card of them. They have the same availability as normal Strelke or Guardia, but they do really well at taking out light options you're liable to see coming in from a German opening. Quick shout out to the Cherno Pijachniki, sorry for my enunciation, for having excellent availability, though they're a bit pricey for what they bring in. These guys are one fewer than Gavardia or the Strelki and have practically the same armaments and cost the same as those two units while still being disheartened. They are still an excellent option to fill out your deck with cheap units that you can toss into a meat grinder, but they aren't as efficient per point as the German disheartened units. Next up, we have the Tenko Desetniki. These guys are excellent close quarter units and typically come at great availability, depending on the deck, and fantastic cost of 15 points. They also usually come with the option of the M2A1 half-track transport, bringing them to 25 points, but getting them that extra support and armor on their way in. At close range, I put money on these guys beating just about any German unit, with the exception of certain Beglite groups or Stemschatzen, but those cost twice as much as the Tanko. Bring them in in pairs and send them through a forest together, and there isn't much that can stop them. One thing I would make sure of is if you're Assaulting a forest that you know has a lot of people in it, make sure that you don't waste the Molotov on groups that have already been Molotovved. Toggle it off when they are on their way to support another Tanko squad, and just use the PPSHs to spray them down. This weapon has a reload speed of about 20 seconds per Molotov, so if they get caught out without having it available, it might not be great. They throw these faster than the Pioneer squads throw their grenades, and unless the game is feeling cheeky, this will interrupt the grenade throw from those units. Typically, these guys beat Pioneers without too much trouble, but if the Pioneer grenade goes off, then it's anybody's game. All in all, Tanko are excellent units, and if you have a choice to bring them in, do so. They won't let you down, no matter what. Whatever you do, don't march them across the open. They only have a 100 meter range at best, and anything longer than that, and they will just get shot with no chance of shooting back. If you start running at a squad of Stammschatzen at 300 meters, they won't make it within 250 meters. In the same vein as the Tanko, we have the Automachiki. Auto are a little more buff with a 10-man squad and two more PPSHs to show for it. They do lack the Molotov, though, as it's been replaced by an AT grenade. While this is useful in some cases, I find that the auto are my least favorite Russian unit. They have a time and a place, but the reality is that they will lose against Pioneers and Flame Squads all of the time, and they have no long-ranged options at all. I bring these in in Phase C after, I hope, all of the Flame units are used. They will do well in close engagements against Rifle Squads or other units that are ill-suited to that range, but the reality is that the auto are 10 points more expensive than the Tanko and are worse in almost every way. They do come in at decent availability at a forced 1-star veterancy, so keeping them commanded is a must. They have a ridiculously fast fire rate of over 2,000 rounds per minute at 3 stars, so that isn't all bad. Just don't trust them to do what the Tanko can do and you'll be fine. Quick mention for the SVT found on certain units on either team. This rifle is ridiculously better than the Mazin or the Car 98, and if you have the chance to bring in a unit with it, do so. It's a great mid-range engagement and has hellish accuracy and much higher base fire rate due to its semi-automatic nature. Next up, we have the Sapri and the Stemaviki. These units are very different, but fall into the same category, so we will look at them at the same time. The Sapri sport the fabled SPT and DP, making them a deadly option at mid-range. Their purpose in life is to blow things up. They carry three frag grenades and are usable below 100 meters range, and do 10 damage and a ton of suppression. These units excel at fighting anything that isn't a flamethrower at close range. The Sturmaviki are the same, but lack the mid-ranged option. They carry the DT machine gun, which can really help, but they traded all their rifles for PPSHs. I would keep these guys in really close if you can, as otherwise you just have one guy firing a gun at potentially an entire enemy squad. Next, we have the same units, but with flamethrowers. The Sapri Rocks and Stemaviki Rocks have just traded their grenades for some flames. Flame units are terrifying in close engagements and excel at stunning Germans caught in the, within their range. The flames fire quickly, likely interrupting grenade throws, much the same as the Tanko, and these units have fantastic weapons to back them up. At 35 points, these guys really are the cream of the crop when it comes to dealing with forests, but their price and availability show that. Be careful when using these, as you likely don't have a lot of them to spare. Now we have the Strafniki, and... meh. There really isn't much else to say. 
They come in at an impressive 20 man strength carrying 3 DP-28s and 13 Mazins that make them very deadly at close to mid-range engagements. That said, they're 40 points, and I'm convinced that they're carrying magnets on their head to attract enemy artillery and bombs. If an enemy sees a 20-man squad, they're just gonna shell it to death. In my experience, these guys are 40 points wasted, but I think that they might be a playstyle thing. My thinking is this, for 40 points you can get two squads of Guardia, spread them out, and have two more people on average. And they are typically better for the cost. More power to you if you know how to use them, but I find them to be a waste of time and energy. Next up, I'm going to look at some specialized units that are only available in one deck on the Allies. First, the Kazaki from 9th Guard. These have four iterations, the Kazaki, Kazaki Mazen, Kazaki PPSH, and Kazaki SVT. Each of these are great units and usually come at less cost than the, Russian, the other Russian decks might see similar units at. Kazaki standard are your base units and they come in a decent mid-ranged complement and great availability at only 20 points. These guys are never a bad option. Following them up, we have the Kazaki Mazen. Same unit as the Kazaki, except instead of an SVT, they have a Mazen. These are worse, but they only cost 15 points and a 9-man squad that's nearly unheard of. Excellent units to pour into the meat grinder in a city fight. Next we have the Kazaki SVT. 11-man squads, 20 points, 10 SVTs, enough said. Get them. I can't say nice enough things about the SVT as a weapon, and these guys come at excellent availability and are cheap enough to really get the upper hand in mid-range engagement. Kazaki PPSH are literally just Automachiki with two fewer men. Use them the same way. While the Osnaz are no longer only in 9th Guard, I will cover them here. The Osnaz are tricky little beasts. They're only a four-man squad and still cost 20 points. Where they shine is the bazooka that they carry, which is devastating to passing tanks. They also come in a really great transport, the 4GPA. I like sending these guys up, turning off their SVTs and lying them in wait for tanks. In decks that get them, I replace my Panzerschreck teams with them and do very well. They come in at a force 2 star veterancy, which in this case is really nice for the accurate, extra accuracy on the bazooka. They're a great unit, but I wouldn't want them fighting another infantry squad. Their low numbers and subpar armaments mean that they will likely lose to an infantry fight if they get into one. Next, from 3rd Mechanized, we have the old Partizani and Partizani DP. Partizani are a confusing unit to look at. They have 12 members, 10 Mazins, and a Molotov to boot. These guys come at great availability and are really quite good for clearing out forests or engaging at mid-range. They're also a very versatile unit for this very reason. The Partizani DP is just 6 dudes with 5 SVTs and a DP that costs 15 points. Fantastic unit to hold an area and support from afar. Apart from general infantry, I won't spend too much time on the leaders in this tab. They're typically all the same and you should just pick the ones that best fit your playstyle. However, a special mention goes to the Tanko Kamradi, which stand apart by bringing in a sniper rifle. Great for supporting your infantry while staying at a safe range, they do cost 30 points and come in relatively low availability though, so bear all that in mind. That concludes my list of allied units that we will be going over in detail today. I won't be covering DLC units just yet, and might in a future video. If I missed any, it's because they're too similar to other units to cover in detail. Now I'm going to move on to the Axis. First up, we have the Panzer Grenadier and Panzer Grenadier with the Panzerfaust. These guys are a little more lethal than their Gavardia counterparts, largely owing to their two LMGs. The main difference to their allied analog is the fact that the base Panzer Grenadier do not come in with an AT option at all. They are also 10 points more expensive. The Panzer Grenadier with the Panzerfaust do have an AT weapon, but come at 33% less squad availability than the base version, making this tab a slew of interesting choices. All in all, while these are a little better than Strauki, they don't set themselves apart by much to be worth mentioning. Moving on, we have a slew of disheartened units that Germany has access to in the base game. Ersatztruppen are a fantastic unit, clocking in at 15 points and excellent availability, and the nothing special armament. They are great to huck into the meat grinder, hold flags that aren't going to see a lot of action, or to take hits for your bigger infantry. I also like using these guys in armored decks to identify guns that someone hasn't turned the HE off of, so I don't amble my tanks into it. For 15 points, I don't think you could ask for a better unit. Moving on, we have the Landeschutzen and the SS Schupo. These guys are both only found in the Korak division, and that division's pretty weird. They are functionally the same as one another, 
and a little bit better than Urzats and the weapons they carry. However, their availability suffers as a result. However, I've never played Korok, so I wouldn't know if you should bring them in or you shouldn't. But they look good in theory. The last conscript unit that we are going to look at for the Axis is the Ostatruppen. These guys are just Urzats Truppen with an MG34 that cost 5 points more. Their availability is also down from the Urzats. Honestly, I don't find these guys too impressive. They are exclusive to 20th Panzer currently, and I've found that 20 points might be a bit much for me to pay for something that just runs away when the Urzats are also on the table in that deck. Take them if you want them, I just don't put my conscripts to the test of combat efficiency, rather I prefer them for their numerosity. As a direct result to the allied Tanko Desetniki, we have the Stostrup and Stostrup MP44. These guys excel at close quarters combat due to their close range weapon and Molotov cocktails. What's more, they can come in the smaller more nimble transports because of their unit size. I typically use them in groups of two as their squad size is usually too small to take more than a few hits. Quick note for the MP44 is this is the first time I've mentioned it in this tutorial. This gun is ridiculously powerful sporting a 40% base accuracy, 300 meters range, and about 86 rounds per minute fire rate at base. Some of the units we will look at later are devastating with these weapons, and they are a great reason to justify the extra points on the infantry for the Axis. Moving on, we have the Sturm Pioneer. These guys have several variants, but they're all more or less the same. Flame, smoke, guns, you get the picture. These guys are also occasionally available in the horse transport, the fastest troop transport on the Axis, if you don't count the bikes. I use these guys much the same way as I use the Stostrup, groups of two and you're more or less unstoppable in cities or forests. Also bear in mind that some decks do not have access to the Flammenwerfer or Ognamachiki, and these units are available. I use them if they're available within the Horsch as a replacement to these as they're typically going to get there just as fast as the bike plus or minus a few seconds. Before we continue with German units, let's fly through some Hungarian units. And quick note, I apologize profusely for how I'm going to pronounce these names. First we have the Gali something 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 and the Hujar Gali something something something. These are basically the same unit save for the latter has three more people in the squad. They're excellent at mid-range, just a pile of hit points and rifles with three LMGs to a squad. They're affordable and dangerous options. Next we have the Hoosierok. These are nearly the same as the last two, just without the machine guns. They still come with the rifles and the health, however they aren't quite as dangerous. They save you the points coming in at 30 points instead of 35 though. The last one I'm going to cover from Hungary is the Lovesh. These guys are standard rifles that are found in Hungarian decks, and for 20 points they are fantastic. For 20 points, even if they didn't come in with guns, 13 men would still be worth it, let alone the fact that they come with a Panzerfaust and 12 rifles. I would cover the rest, but honestly they're mostly just variations on these one that we've gone over so far. And also, god forbid I try to pronounce the rest of Hungary's units. Jumping back over to Germany, we have the Sischrung. These are unique units in the decks that can take them and in the weapons they carry. Another 20 point squad that comes at excellent availability with the GRB 39, which is basically a souped up PTRD with 60mm of penetration. However, it suffers with only a 300m range. These guys are still excellent at stopping allied half tracks and troop transports that are further away than normal AT units could deal with. Onwards to the Big Light series. There are two of these, Big Light Pioneer and my favorite infantry in the game by a long shot. 13 mans to a squad, they come with 9 MP44s, 3 semi-automatic rifles, an LMG, and an HE grenade. Consistently, these guys will kill their way and then summon enemy infantry. They surprise me literally every time I bring them in. At a 40 point price tag, they're quite the endeavor to bring in, but I assure you that if they aren't misused, they will be worth double that at least. I would advise keeping them in forests or in a city. In the open they aren't great, but with some cover they will slaughter most anything they see. The Big Light Grenadier are basically the same, just without the grenade. Everything that was true about the Pioneer is true here, save for their reliability in forest fights. Without the grenades, they aren't as guaranteed to win, but they still have quite the armament are, and are a formidable force to come up against. These two units are great but come at a fairly low availability so use them carefully. The last unit that I'm going to cover in detail is the Sturmschutzen. 
While there are many variants of this with varying degrees of weapons, being the Sturmjäger, Sturmschkijäger, and Fallschirmsturmjäger found in the later DLC divisions, the Sturmjäger are probably the base and best of all these. These guys are simple and have one specialty. They carry 13 MP44s and a Panzerfaust. They are scary as hell if they come up against something within their range, because typically it's just a few shot noises, and the enemy numbers decrease quickly. The only downside to these guys is their 40 point price tag, making them an investment, especially if you've misused or caught them in the open. Keep them in close though and they will perform fantastically for you. There are, of course, other units in the base game and otherwise that I didn't cover, but if I went over them all, this video would be an hour long. For the most part, things that I've said about all of those I covered will be applicable across the board for anything with similar armaments. With that in mind, let's jump into some strategies to employ when using these units. I've covered this before, but when you build a deck, I would make sure that you have something in each phase that will be able to take care of any situation. Panzer Grenadier and Strelke are great, but they aren't going to win you any close quarters engagements with units that are better suited for it. There is a very granular feature of micromanaging in this game to deal with grenades from enemies. If you're engaging a squad with grenades in a city, you can building hop to within 100 meters range of them, fire for a second, then command your units to hop back out of range. This will cause the units with grenades to waste time aiming, and then fail to throw because you've left their range. This is dangerous and typically too much to do if anything else is on your plate, or if it's not a desperate engagement, but it is something that you can do. Bear in mind that Molotovs throw faster than grenades and typically can't be avoided in this way. In the same vein as this, if you're engaging enemy flame units, you can attempt to hop into a building with them. They won't be able to use their flames on the same building they are in, but this usually ends with your units surrendering in transit. Make sure to kill as many enemy infantry while they are in the open as possible. While you're going to have your units on return fire, you also want them to clean up infantry that are advancing on a city where they will become much harder to deal with. Keep in mind that your weapons have varying ranges. A typical LMG is a 750 meter range, while rifles only have 500 meter range. Telling your units to attack move somewhere might have them getting hung up on something at 750 meters, unable to use the rest of their weapons. For this, I would advise turning off the LMG while they're in the open, trying to achieve a tree line or city in secret and safely. Smoke is not only your friend for infantry, it is a necessity. I love bringing in leader units that have smoke, but aside from them, most flame troops, a few AT squads, and some others have smoke also. This is great for helping your units into effective range without them losing men or becoming suppressed. You can use these by default by pressing B and clicking where you would like the smoke to be placed. These are really short range and the aim is kind of finicky, so bear all that in mind when you're placing it. That's going to do it for my infantry tactics guides. Some closing remarks is that there are a lot of infantry in the game, and Korok is a weird division. Thanks for watching. This one got a lot longer than I thought it was going to. Not quite sure where to go next. If anyone wants to see any particular topics, please let me know in the comments. Hope you've learned something.